morning and good afternoon for those of you uh, in a location that is already 12.30. My name is Carlos Morales and I am a um, vice chair for HETS, the Hispanic Education Telecommunication Service uh, based in Puerto Rico. And uh, on my daily uh, work, I am president of TCC Connect Campus, which is uh, the online campus at Tarrant County College District in Fort Worth, Texas. This morning, I'm uh, the host um, for one of our distance learning initiatives, which is to share among the membership uh, some of the best practices that they have been developing in regards to online faculty development, uh, training, uh, strategies for course development. Again, the whole, the whole book, if you will, as we uh, want to again share among the, the membership. This morning, I have two colleagues that I just met over over a blackboard here, Antonia Saldiva and Josefina Sosa. Both of them are from a uh, University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, and they are uh, in the Center for Online Learning and Teaching Technology, and they will be the uh, professionals, the, co the colleagues, uh, delivering the session this uh, morning. So if I can ask them to quickly um, take over the uh, presentation, and then I'll, I'll be on the side, and I will return again uh, at, the, at the end, maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes before the 12.30 uh, hour. So Josefina and Antonio, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, just really quick, can everyone hear me correct, uh, clearly? If you can hear me yes, clearly, can, go ahead. We can hear you. And, uh, okay, perfect. I know that we have some feedback from an open mic, so I'm going to... Uh, uh, you you're online. Um, thank you again so much for joining us. It is morning for us. I know some of you are in... Um, in areas where it's already in the afternoon, so good afternoon. I'm one of the instructional designers here at COLT, as we call ourselves, that's the acronym. Um, I have been with the university for over 15 years, and I am located out of the Edinburgh campus in um, here at the university. But we'll get in, into it a little bit, and I'll go ahead and have Tony kind of say a little bit about herself. Tony? He may have his microphone in mute, so we'll, we'll give him another minute. Okay. Yeah, I see her microphone went off. Ray, can... Uh, are you able to? Well, what I'm going to do is, um, I think Tony right now is having a difficulty with her microphone. Um, Tony Sandivad is one of our instructional designers located out of the Brownsville campus. Our university is actually spread out. And I'm going to go ahead and jump in if there's no objections. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, for those of you who are not too familiar with Blackboard Collaborate, in the lower center portion, you'll see a little man with a hand raised. If you have any questions, just go ahead and click that. Um, if you um, want more information or if you want us to share this with you, we would be happy to share the PowerPoint with you as well. So, um, like, we, like uh, Professor Morales had stated, we are from the University of Texas Rio Grande yeah, Valley. And our presentation is going to be on the blueprinting process. Uh, in particular, our quality, it's basically our quality assurance process for the online programs here at the university. Um, and I know that the PowerPoint slide says Francisco and Jessica. Actually, that's a slip up. We forgot to take their names off of it, so excuse that. So just a little bit about the session topics. Who, we're going to cover who we are. We're going to identify challenges or the reasons why we came up with this process or actually implemented this process, the actual implementation of the blueprinting, 
and where we're going next, and then of course we'll have a Q and A with everyone if if anyone has any questions. So a little bit about our university. Uh, again, we're the University of Texas at Rio Grande Valley, and we're located in the south part of Texas. Now, for the most part, if you are familiar with Texas, when you say South Texas, people think San Antonio. That is actually considered mid-Texas for us. We are about three hours south of that. We are near the Mexican border. And in fact, uh, one of the campuses, I believe, has part of it, of the border wall going through it, I believe. Right, Tony and Ray? I'm not 100% sure because that's not the campus that I'm on. But um, we are the newest component to the UT system. And um, our official doors opened August 31st in 2015. So we're fairly new to, as a university here in the state of Texas and let alone the United States. Uh, again, we are a distributed campus. We do have six main camp, well, six large campuses. But we do have some little satellite campuses spread out as well. Plus, we also have a medical school. We do offer 117 programs, uh, roughly about 64 undergraduate, 49 master's uh, doctoral and cooperative doctoral programs. Periodically, I'm going to do a mic check because I'm unfortunately not on a headset. So is everyone hearing me okay? Yes? No? Yes, we're hearing you. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so um, again, like I had stated earlier, we are spread across 100 miles. And uh, roughly our population of students is a little over 29,000 students, in which 89% of them are Hispanic students. We are considered the second largest Hispanic serving institution in the nation. And um, we, I'm going to just share with you a couple of little stats that we have that come out of our office. Our office is primarily for online courses. However, we do assist with hybrid courses or what's called reduced seats. Um, we do use Quality Matters as part of our process that we are going to talk about. So a couple of the online stats. Uh, for fall 2019, we had um, easily over 180 online courses offered, and uh, we've noticed just a steady trend of that. We had uh, 201 hybrid courses offered as well, which means that over 15,000 students were at least taking one online class. So that's over 15,000 out of the 29,000 plus that we have. Uh, 78,541 online courses were, were generated as CG courses. Um, and then, of course, we have over 373 faculty members that taught online. Plus, we have over 50 programs on track. Now, of those 373 that we're currently teaching, that's not just the faculty that have been Quality Matters certified. Those are the ones that we're teaching in the fall. It, it ranges throughout. Overall, because we do have um, quality matters as the backbone for our blueprint, we do have or we do require faculty members to go ahead and be certified through uh, the ATP QMR. So we have over 1,260 quality matters accounts. And those are 935, of those 935 are faculty member or staff members that actually have taken professional development through Quality Matters. And that could be applying the Quality Matters rubric to um, any of the other professional developments that are offered through, through uh, Quality Matters. We do have 24 peer reviewers that have gone to that level and two master reviewers. And I believe actually Tony is one of our master reviewers. Um, and um, we have 14 facilitators. Now, the facilitators are out of our office because we are so spread out. We have two, what we call two main campuses or mirror campuses. The Edinburgh campus um, has several faculty members. 
I'm sorry, but facilitate second do both online and face to face as opposed to the principal one. And then out of those we have forty six quality matter certified courses. Um, some of the goals for our department, we are here to promote excellence in, and then also provide educational opportunities, and we also want to focus on student success. Now, the way that we do that, obviously, is by encouraging faculty and departments to come in and work with us so that we can produce quality courses. We do want faculty success to trickle down to the students, obviously. Uh, and like stated before, we work with young hybrid, and we do work with augmented courses. Now, augmented courses could be anything from, let's say that I have a face-to-face -face class. I can use Blackboard to simply just, hold on. I'm sorry, can, are you all getting the feedback? There's someone with their mic open. Yeah, I think it might be the um, someone else. Okay, there we go. It, it turned off. Okay, I apologize for that feedback. Um, so augmented courses, it could be anything from like, for example, if I'm teaching a class and I do my quizzes online using Blackboard, that would be augmented. Um, so we do also offer assistance to those to those uh, faculty members using augmented co components and also the students. And of course, we're here, the meat and bones of this presentation is to promote quality, excellence, and innovation in all of our courses. We do have a component in-house that is also research-based. Uh, our research, the head of research is Dr. Ram de la Rosa, in which any of our, any of my colleagues also participate and we pair up with faculty members throughout and other institutions to participate in, in research as well. Don't worry, I'm not gonna read all of this to you all, but here's a, a kind of a, a glimpse at some of the online programs that we do have. We primarily have four major components here, which is fully online. We have certificates. For example, uh, Spanish translation has a certificate at a graduate level. We have accelerated programs um, I believe our, we have more coming online like UX, UI. We have one that is an MBA fully online in, that's completely in Spanish as well. And we do have partially online programs such as the Health Service Technology and the B, BMS, which is Multidisciplinary Studies. The purpose, okay, so the purpose for the blueprinting process was that we opened our doors, obviously, in 2017. So we are officially now, come this August, we will be five years old. And what was happening is because of the new situation that we were in, where all of a sudden new university, we're spread across, there was a need for online learning. New accelerated programs were coming on board. To facilitate that, there's also an initiative to globalize UTRGV. So uh, we have now programs that are reaching, I believe one that came about, and I'll confirm, I believe one is in Nigeria. And then there's a couple of them that are offered in Latin America and stuff like that. Our department was also called to work towards ensuring the quality of all these courses because we could have all these online courses, but if it was just used as a, a repository, then the students were getting gypped on a good quality education. Um, and then of course they made it harder for faculty members to keep up with the development if they were developing as they were teaching. And as you all know, I, I don't know how many of you are faculty members, but I myself have fallen into that trap where I'll develop like one week ahead for face-to-face. -face. Now imagine doing this in an online environment where things go by super fast. So, also part of the purpose for this was that faculty members and programs and departments were coming to us for training. And in particular, certain departments, especially the ones that teach core, were having what we call large online classrooms. And large online classes means that the faculty member has 75 plus students in there. 
Uh, we have a couple of biology courses that are fully online that have over 300 students in there. So a lot of it was training on the faculty member that they needed, and we were able to pair up or partner up with academic uh, impressions in order to be able to get academic coaches for them. Um, also, there were some faculty members that were just seeking help with their course because maybe their evaluations for their online course weren't as stellar as they thought. So they realized, okay, maybe if I reach out to Colt and I start the blueprinting process, it will help me with the goal that I wanted which at the end in this case was a better evaluation. Okay, our process. The program is based on Quality Matters rubric, which uh, we are in the sixth edition. And obviously this ensures quality and exemplary courses. We do use a hybrid style format. The way that we set it up is that we have a workshop in which the faculty member becomes the student. So basically we try to emulate what this, your student would be doing if they were enrolled in an online class. So let's say that you were the faculty member and I was your student. If I didn't know how to get started or how to navigate to your, for your course, there's a higher probability that I'm gonna drop the class. So what we wanna do is we wanna put the faculty members in that same situation. Um, let them go through the steps of what it, it really, what the students are gonna be doing. Do I know how to get started in a workshop in this course? Uh, we also paired that up with meetings in the sense, I know it says here every week, it's a little different based off of the program. I am not going to lie to you. For the most part, initially we started off that every single week we would meet with them in a group face-to-face, -face, which is that hybrid format. But then what happened was that obviously, as we all know, faculty gets busy, people go off to conferences, our department, us, we ended up going to conferences as well. So it was a little harder to schedule that face time. So some faculty members and some programs decided to meet face-to-face -face every other week. And then in between, they would meet virtually online. But we would still consider them live sessions. Um, and then, of course, the live sessions were meant so that the faculty members could collaborate with each other. They could um, exchange ideas, stay on track, um, and just get that feedback that they, they some required. In addition, I do want to add on there that some of the programs that we work with have faculty members who do not live in the state. So the only method that they could attend the sessions was through a virtual meet and meeting, kind of like either Zoom or what we're doing right now. After that, the initial meetings, uh, everyone would go online and start working with their faculty and develop their course first on paper. We also assign an instructional designer to every single faculty member. So for example, let's say that, and I'm just gonna pick on a name randomly, um, Professor oh, Elaine Reese, please excuse me, I don't have my glasses, so I'm kind of, yes. So let's say that Professor Reese is developing and um, she is gonna start the blueprint process. So what I would do as her assigned instructional de designer is reach out to her and say, you know, I've been assigned to, to assist you throughout the process. So once we do that, then we jump in. Um, the benefits from this, it promotes departmental collaboration. It provides a cohesive program in which the goals of the, and the objectives align. So you don't have what we call a, the double dipping effect where one class is teaching and doing the exact same thing as another. So in essence, the students are kind of getting gypped because they're doing the same work. Um, it promotes cost-effective course development by leveraging common course practices, utilizing templates and technology, and it also incorporates the quality matter standards that we are seeking to, to reach. Now, we've done this several times. Uh, we've had several iterations of the blueprint process. We have had, just like anything, and as some of you are familiar with Quality Matters, you don't get it right the first time. There's always feedback from the faculty, feedback from the instructional designers, from the facilitators. Um, and so we have revised it to kind of meet the needs of the faculty members. 
So, and, and these are some of the revisions that we did. So faculty members wanted more familiarity with the QM standards. So that was addressed by having them take the rubric and making it a requirement, the APP QMR. Before when we initially started, that wasn't necessarily a requirement to have before you started the workshop. Now it is. Uh, also, some faculty and some participants, even I think myself, I complained that some of the documents were not really user-friendly. So we went ahead and redesigned some of the layouts and the annotations so that it became more uh, friendly to use. We also incorporated accessibility and universal design as part of a module, whereas in the initial stages, that wasn't addressed in the beginning as its own module. It was addressed as like a subchapter, but it wasn't its own model in itself, but we now actually have a workshop around it. We also added lectures or what we call micro lectures in regards to every single module that we have faculty members go through. And now, and this is perhaps the one part that faculty kind of still groan about, we ask them to submit assignments. So we really take them through what a student would, would be doing if they were in their online course. We have them submit assignments every week, just like they would have their students submit to them. Now, a little bit about the team here. In regards to quality matters, uh, we do have all of our instructional designer and developers have taken the Applying the Quality Matters rubric. They all have become peer reviewers. They are also certified as uh, online and face-to-face -face facilitators for the APPQMR, which is the Applying the Quality Matters rubric. And in fact, I think next week we have one of our face-to-face. -face. And the way that we do it is that we rotate. Uh, one is face-to-face -face in, let's say, Edinburgh, then the following one is online in Brownsville. And then we rotate so that way there's an even distribution and faculty members can pick and choose which one they want to go to. Um, faculty and staff, well, I already gave you those stats. It's um, basically the number of courses. Oh, we do have five courses officially QM certified. So we perform our own internal reviews using the Quality Matters rubric. Once that's done and the course is taught several times, then faculty members here at the university do have the option to have it sent off to be officially reviewed through QM's official reviewer, review team. And uh, we do have 45 that now have been officially recognized and reviewed by Quality Matters. Are there any questions so far? Can everyone hear me? If you can hear me, go ahead and raise your hand. Perfect, thank you so much. I noticed that all the mics went off all of a sudden, so I kind of feel like I'm talking to myself, but thank you so much. Um, and this is a quick glance of the process itself that, um, I'm going to just kind of go over really quick and then I'm going to have Tony jump in. So this is a glance of what we have. Um, as you can tell, we start off with an introductory meeting first and then we move on. I like to call this our Candyland map, just simply because it looks very colorful. Um, yeah, so once we have the initial meeting with the higher ups, like the dean, the department chair and all that, we and that's usually our director and our instructional designer three, which is which is Jessica Sanchez. They are the ones that usually have the introductory meeting. Then we follow it up with a faculty meeting at the blueprint process overview. Um, after that, we kind of just go down the line. And Tony, are you up and running with the mic? Let me double check here. Ray, can you hear me? Yes. I don't know if Tony she's saying that she's starting on slide 18. She's starting on slide 18? Oh, I can't tell what slide that is. Oh, slide 12. I think you're in 12, yeah. Okay, 
See, this is what happens when you don't have your glasses. I apologize <laughs> for that. Okay, so uh, really quick on here. Um, you may notice that we have a couple of little things called new. That is what we added after the feedback. So, for example, curriculum mapping was not a part of the original blueprinting process. And now we do cover that with the faculty member, faculty members together as a group, as a department. We also incorporated Blackboard training. And that is not just necessarily Blackboard training like the basics. We go over special topics, maybe technology that they want to use, such as Panapto for lecture capturing, all of that. We do have now, as I mentioned before, the accessibility and universal design. That has become its own module because of uh, we wanted to make sure that all of our courses met the law, which we all know that that's at 100%. Um, we noticed that that wasn't being met when the blueprinting process was going through. So uh, we went ahead and, and made that its own module, and we even go in and show them how to make their syllabus accessible. So like I mentioned before, the introductory meeting is with our director, which is Francisco Garcia, and it's usually with the dean of that college and the department chair. And this is really to develop a timeline. So for example, um, one of the ones that I know that is coming up pretty soon, actually, is the master's in UX and UI. Right now, they're in this phase, introductory meeting. They're still trying to figure out a timeline as to when they want to roll out the program, when things are going to actually start. So if they want to have their courses up uh, by fall 2020, then they should have actually started a long time ago, the, this process. But um, we need to set realistic goals and expectations on a timeline. We can't just say, oh, yeah, let's have this entire program up in two weeks, because that, that is not going to happen. The blueprinting process itself, the overview for faculty. Now, this is at a different meeting in which now that's the department chair or the coordinator. And this includes all the professors and whoever's going to be facilitating the workshop. So this is where the faculty members look at the timeline, and then they also distribute the courses that they're going to develop. So if I'm going to be developing, I don't know, a, a course in color theory, I'm going to make sure that my course and my goals align with what I need, but then at the same time, my course is a precursor to what somebody else's. Well, then that means I need to work with Tony, for example, to make sure that what I'm teaching the students or what's being developed will support her class when the students get to her class. So that's the, another reason why the distribution is very important. And then the faculty member goes over the faculty agreement. So the timeline allows them to kind of move their schedule around, and then they agree to that with, along with their instructional designers. So if every Friday they are going to submit something to them, and then feedback turnaround time is two days later, then that is the agreement that they've chosen. So that they have to stick to that. Then the meetings start. This is where they start jumping into the workshop. Now we can meet either weekly, bi-weekly, depending on the program. We do have face-to-face -face instruction in which, for example, the learning objectives, that is one that we normally make two weeks long because that is the objectives are, are seem to be the one that people struggle the most in the sense that they have to be able to distribute it and make sure that everyone covers everything that is needed for the program and that there's no double dipping. They're also required to submit a blueprint document online for feedback. And I'll show you a glimpse. Oh, but before they start submitting the document, they have to do the curriculum mapping. And this is, like I said before, where the distribution uh, falls under. So for example, let's say Tony is going to do course one. I'm going to do course two, and Ray's going to do course three. We need to make sure that the programs and outcomes align with everyone across and that there's not really uh, overlapping or if there is a need for overlapping, that it, it is happening. And instructional design and student needs. One of the modules that is 
perhaps the most important because it sets the tone of how the course is going to develop is module one in which we launch the original the initial introduction to the workshop so the faculty member or the participants sometimes they're not the faculty member it could be a ta or ga who is actually doing this um, they are introduced to the layout the way that the modules are working in the blueprint process then they are introduced to their assigned instructional designer then after that what they do is we ask them to look at why instructional design is important in course the course development a lot of the times if you think about it um, unless you're out of the college of education do you most faculty are not taught about the importance of the design when developing a course the, you know a lot of them are more research based and so it's kind of letting or opening their eyes to why it's important and why you can't just put up an article and say do a paper without giving them actual instruction letting them know what the goal is and doing the alignment in it and then of course we conduct a needs assessment the needs assessment is so that the faculty member and the program itself knows their target audience. Um, they need to know what, what kind of students are they going to have? What is expected of them once they graduate from their program? What is the profession that the students who are in your program are likely seeking? So that way you can tailor the development to the needs of the students. And I think that's Tony, right? Yes. I'm going to keep myself because I think that's going to cause problems. You hear me? I'm fine. Okay. So I'll leave it to Hayward. Chelsea, can you hear me? So as Jesse mentioned, they started the module. They started their, thank you, um, with module one. And this is the way the layout or the course structure has been set up uh, as they're going through it. And just to keep in mind as they're going through it, some of these sessions are face-to-face uh, -face sessions and some of them are um, online sessions. So, and keeping that in mind, this particular module, they would move on to module two. And this module, they discuss the uh, quality matter standard two and go into the specific standards, uh, the importance of it, which is of course having those measurable outcomes, measurable objectives. Um, talking about the alignment, Discussing the importance of developing uh, these measurable objectives at the same time in the Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, talking to them about the different levels uh, of the Bloom's taxonomy depending on their course. Is it an intro course, uh, an advanced course? Um, as they're going through this, also we provide them examples of measurable outcomes, measurable objectives. Um, what actions, verbs to utilize, which ones to not utilize. Again, what we focus and we, uh, we stress on here on this particular module is the alignment, is to be able to have that alignment between the course or the program goals, the course outcomes, and their module, their weekly uh, objectives. At the end of the module, they are uh, asked to submit a um, blueprint program for the blueprint, sorry, program, program goals, course outcomes, and their weekly learning objectives. Um, and I will show you an example right now of that particular um, form that they need to submit. So they are asked to submit the course blueprint form, which is here. So they provide us the course description, program goals, and the course outcomes, as well as their learning objectives. This is a form that gets submitted to the instructional their instructional designer, and the instructional designer will review it and provide them feedback. Um, whether it's the, you know, it's not a measurable out, uh, outcome, a measurable objective, and just providing them feedback on how they can modify these, uh, making these particular uh, outcomes or objectives measurable. And they move on to module three on this particular one, and they cover, uh, we cover with them the specific standards that make up that standard eight, which is access accessibility and the importance of having or having your course being accessible to all your students. Um, and discussing why should we care, you know, who is responsible for this? Because we're always wondering, well, I'm not, it's the uh, disabilities office or student services. But again, it's, it's always being able to, to see, you know, we are responsible for our courses in moving forward and making our course accessible to all our students. Uh, so we make sure to cover the federal legislation that addresses digital access accessibility. 
the different types of disabilities, you know, what to consider when developing these instructional materials. Uh, this particular meeting is face-to-face. -face. And in this particular meeting, they cover uh, Microsoft Word documents, so we cover it with them, and how to make their course syllabus accessible. Uh, I'll talk about, uh, talk about Blackboard Ally and how to determine if their content that they're putting in Blackboard is accessible. They're also, uh, at the end, they're asked to create and submit that course syllabus. And depending on the faculty or the workshop at the time frame as well, faculty are asked to open up a document or their course syllabus and walk them through in how to create and how to make that course syllabus accessible. And module four, we cover the assessing the learner. So in this particular standard, Quality Matters Standard 3, it focuses on assessments. And we talk, again, we go back to, as we're going through these modules, is reiterating that alignment. It's important to have that alignment. Now we have developed the uh, assessments or the outcomes and objectives, and we have them look at a, uh, assessment. Now why should assessment align with their objectives? What happens if components of a course are misaligned? And what do well-aligned assessments look like? So we provide them those examples. Um, we also discuss or cover different types of assessments, uh, what level they fall within the Bloom's taxonomy. So again, we cover, we cover that throughout the modules. Uh, and also differences between traditional assessment and authentic assessments, and why we want authentic assessments. Um, so on the right, you see that image. That is the document that they are asked to complete and submitting that document. So again, as Jesse mentioned, as they go through these modules, they're asked not just to complete this blueprint, at the same time as having these artifacts that they have to submit uh, rubric and assessing, is having also creating that rubric, that one uh, exam or a discussion rubric, whatever their choice, uh, but they are asked to submit these activities. And module five is the learning activities and materials. And this particular one um, is Cube standard four and five. And on this one is talking about quality learning activities. The what are the best activities for developing the learner's ability to meet these objectives? Uh, what do the students need to do or complete in order for them to meet those objectives at the end of the course? Um, the same thing with the materials. Does the learner need to be successful with the assessment and activities? Uh, we talked to them about authentic learning, rigorous activities, interactive activities. Um, some examples of the learner interactions that we discussed is setting up groups. Um, best practices for setting up groups, not as far as setting them up in Blackboard, as far as how to break them up. Best practices in the team building projects. And also the expectations and guidelines, which is important uh, for the students to know that. In module six, we move on to the technology. And this particular um, module or workshop is offered face-to-face, -face, or it's a requirement for faculty to attend face-to-face. -face. And again, this one in Quality Matters Standard 6. And again, we, we go back and discuss to them about the technology. What are they wanting to, uh, thinking about integrating into their course? Uh, and it's not just using technology just to use technology, but to make sure, again, we have that alignment. Is it assisting uh, the students to meet those outcomes? Uh, some of the uh, technology that we cover with them is the current technologies that we, our topic is the student response systems, uh, webinar conferencing, audio recordings. Here we use Panopto, uh, Camtasia. We also cover some Blackboard tools that they can use uh, within the LMS. And just keep it in mind as we're going through is to make their content engaging, engage the student. Um, Along with this in this particular module, we also cover some OER online resources that are available to the faculty, uh, that they don't have to create anything that's, uh, from scratch. So again, we try to keep, as we're going through, is what type of technology are they able to integrate to the course? And again, keep it in mind, the alignment, as well as keeping the student engaged with the content. Now, in our Module 7, we talked to faculty on the course overview and delivery, and this covers the QM standard 1 and 7. And here, the, the topics that we talk about, or the, the topics we discuss, is instructor introduction, how important it is to have that instructor introduction, right? 
Uh, have that welcome. Make the student welcome as soon as they log into your course. Um, the student introductions as well. Your communication ex uh, expectations from your student. Uh, what technical support or academic student services support do they need to be in order to be successful again in your course or as they attend the, here, the institution, your institution? And the example view that they are asked to submit is a set of a welcome start here, a professor bio that they're asked to uh, create and submit. So that, again, the designer can be able to review and provide the feedback. Another area that we also cover here is we come back to and bring up the course syllabus. We have a course syllabus in the module as in creating that accessible syllabus, but now as we're getting already into designing the course and getting to the end, and looking at what is important, what does what does our student or what do our students need to know, what type of information for them to be again successful in your course, right? So we talk about policies, what kind of policies to include, uh, the type of method that they're going to be using, communication method, um, with it, whether it's uh, web conferencing, emailing, office hours, and then also technical support. The um, important here that we provide and we give them is creating that presence for the instructor. That it's not just someone, you know, they're just submitting work and looking at it. It's actually someone behind, you know, with the course and trying and moving forward and having someone providing that um, feedback for that student. And then um, also there's a live session and this is co uh, coach's presentation. There are some courses that uh, faculty have that assist with the grading, so they uh, discuss those particular uh, things of what to do and what not to do uh, in having those co coaches in their courses. The weekly blueprint and course template, at, when they complete that um, module, they're asked to complete a weekly blueprint, which is what you see on the left, and they're asked for them to complete that for every week. Some uh, faculty may choose to, at this point, they have a course shell. They may choose to uh, start developing in their course, or they can choose to uh, complete the form that you see on the left. Uh, that is up to them. But once they complete that, um, the content in Blackboard, then the designer, whether it's the blueprint form or in the content, the designer will go in there and provide the faculty uh, feedback. As far as any templates or anything that is based on the program, now the goal here again is, is giving the structure for the program, this uh, template that we give the program. So again, we want to give that student that con uh, consistency throughout the program that they, when they go into one course, two or three courses within the program, that it's the same thing. They don't have to learn the whole course. Where's my content? Where are my announcements? Uh, where do I get this information or uh, technology? They're aware, and again, the template, we want to keep that consistent throughout the program. That's the goal of providing them that template. Once they do the development, um, the blueprint form, and they complete the modules, they are ready to, they're done with the development, the, which they provide the feedback from the designer, and now, we're getting in the phase of reviewing these courses. Once the faculty is done developing, the process that we have for reviewing these courses is that if, when the designer is assigned to them to complete the initial review, they're assigned designer, they meet the QM standards. If they meet the QM standards, then they, they'll have one more designer to go in there and complete a second review. So there are always two reviews here. Whether it's one, um, when one designer meets and reviews the course. You have two different people viewing the course. So again, there's some things that maybe we overlook that another designer can, can catch on that. And that's behind why we do these two reviews. Uh, if the course is not me, we ask the faculty uh, to make these modifications by providing them that feedback and the recommendation that they need in order for them to meet those standards. Um, we can either meet with the faculty one-on-one -on -one with them to talk about the feedback and the recommendations. Again, it just depends on how the faculty wants to work with that designer. Um, and once they're done with those modifications, then we have a second uh, reviewer and a designer that comes in to complete that um, second review. That second review meets, then the course is uh, 
ready to launch and we're ready to offer the course for the first time after those two reviews have been um, met. And that's our process. And that's the process that we are uh, currently doing, as Josie mentioned. Um, as there have been different revisions of this, so as we go and as we're moving forward, we notice some things work, some things not work. Uh, so again, uh, any questions or anything regarding our process? Yes, Tony, we do have a question. Um, I believe it's from David Denny and Austin. Is it Hein? Let's see if. David, were you able to uh, to use your your mic or your audio? Hi, can you hear us? Yes, we can now. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, first question is, I see you're recording this. Can we get a copy of the recording? Uh, yes, it's going to be sent out. Okay. Thank you. And then David has a couple of questions he wants to ask, too. Sure. Okay, first question. Um, we have found that QM didn't quite uh, meet some of the standards that we had uh, for our institution, which is Tarrant County College. So we're uh, working on developing a second set of standards to go along with that. Have you experienced anything like that, where QM didn't quite have some of the standards that you wanted to incorporate? Well, I mean, not necessarily, but we have, uh, we do build upon them. We kind of use them as the backbone and then we build and kind of tailor it towards, um, towards the program now the the one that i can tell you that obviously no matter how you slice it it will it's not up to par to what we wanted and what the law says is accessibility because i mean i don't know how familiar anyone is with quality matters they literally have a statement that says meeting qm does not mean that you meet the law or i'm obviously paraphrasing but you know something like that so for our purposes we went ahead and that's actually what prompted us to um remove accessibility where it was hidden in one of the modules and make it its own. So that way it, it kind of shined more light on it. And that was one of the things that in our case, QM didn't necessarily meet what we wanted. So we just kind of, yeah, we're going to use QM as a basis, but this is our expectations on top of this. I hope that answers your question. That did. Thank you very much. And another real short one, um, your instructional sure. designers, are they involved in the building process at all, or are they mostly just checking the work, so to speak? Um, yes and yes. Um, and by, by my dad, it, it varies, obviously, on the faculty member in the sense that if they're fairly new to the LMS and uh, need some help, we're not going to turn them down, but at the same time, I don't know if I mentioned, but if a faculty member or a program goes through our blueprinting process, they get, they get a stipend. So our instructional designers are not going to do it for them because obviously they're not going to get the stipend, but we will help them maybe mock up one module so that way the faculty member knows how, to, how it's supposed to look. And of course, there's little things here and there that, you know, the formatting on something or, or hey, I need... I need help on accessibility. I don't know how to quite do this. Can you help me out? We'll help them, but it's not where we're going to sit there and develop the course um, by the faculty member giving us the content and we'll do it for them. No. Uh, part of the policy and that initial uh, overview meeting that they have, that they have to sign with the agreement, is that they will be creating the course themselves. Uh, we will give feedback and we try not to do it for them, 
But of course, I'm not going to lie, there's times where we've had to step in and help assist with the development because um, the schedule has gotten changed, whereas, let's say, the the class was supposed to be offered in the spring, and now all of a sudden, no, we're kidding. We're offering this spring, I mean, this fall, so you have now four months less to develop. So okay. something like that, Perfect. yeah. Thank you very much. And how long is your design process for the, from start to finish? Okay, so from start to finish, roughly put about a week on all of them, except for the learning module, that's two weeks. So I would say between 10 to 11 weeks total, the actual blueprinting process. That is not including the development phase. Now, once they finish the workshop and they submit all the assignments and artifacts, they go into the development phase where they go, in, like Tony had mentioned, they'll start developing in the course itself. That could take up to several months, or I've seen faculty members kind of pound out a course in less than three weeks. Okay. And if that, when you see them do that in less than three weeks, do they have a kind of a prior course that they've built out? And yeah. Kind of yeah, I didn't want to say that, but yeah. Going in and, yeah, kind of pulling out of that course. And then uh, early on, early on, you mentioned uh, talking to talking about technology and tools and like a blackboard overview. Like I think it was meeting one or meeting two or meeting three. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. do you, have you created like some artifacts that you put in there, like a list of all the tools that you have? available in Blackboard and then maybe they can check off the ones they're familiar with so that they're only getting focused on the ones that they're not familiar with. Does that make sense? Um, we used to have a list like that many years ago, but honestly, we ha we don't necessarily use that anymore. Um, we do provide several different levels of training in, in the technology module. So, I mean, we do have like an informal list and it's in the technology module itself. But that's not to say that that's all the technology that we, that the faculty has available to them. So it's, okay. it's I, I'm a, I have a quick question too. One of the things we were writing up and looking at maybe doing was, uh, they say it's a biology faculty and we're about to do a peer developed biology course. Um, we were looking at going into our existing biology courses, the ones that are, you know, kind of in, uh, that are in stasis that aren't being used right now and the ones that are currently being used. And we were yes. looking at looking at the artifacts of that and sharing them with the faculty. Is, is that something y'all have done in the past? We have done that in the past, especially if it's a program that has a well-established, I guess, database of, of artifacts. Um, however, a lot of the times we do rely on the program coordinator to you know to see where the content and if things are fresh. Kind of like yes. you don't want to go so far back that you're. You're exactly. talking about, you know, ancient artifacts that are no longer applicable. Yes. So. yes. Okay. Good. That's a, oh, that's what I was wondering. And also, when you've done that in the past, has that overwhelmed faculty when you show them a course that's kind of built out and they uh, uh, see that they they try and adjust to the, what you're showing them, or do you think they just take it as hey, this is a reference point you may want to look at this if they've been. It depends on okay. the faculty. Uh, Honestly, I work with the arts and humanities quite a bit, and a lot of the times yeah. they are visual people, so they want to see yeah. what it's supposed to look like. We do have yes, some. I have a, I'm an arts and humanities person too, so I completely understand that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I actually teach out of uh, the art department, so they are extremely visual. Um, yes, so it does help for them to see, even if it's like, and this is where it goes back to how far our instructional designers and developers help, we will go as far as mocking up week one so that the, the visual people can see what it looks like. Um, we have uh, showcased wonderful courses, you know, that have been finished from top to bottom, the ones that we feel are exemplary. Uh, and some faculty do appreciate seeing what the end result is, because it, yes, it is hard to visualize that. Thank you, David and, and Austin, for the questions. There is a question from Martha at 12.17. What have been your major challenges with the implementation of online courses and activities? Um, I have to be honest, the challenge has been a little bit of resistance, in, at least in, that I've encountered, resistance in the faculty. I don't know if any of my fellow colleagues would agree. Um, and it's not really resistance in the in the sense that they don't want to do it, it's just time-wise, 
they're so spread out and so spread thin that it's hard for them to kind of just keep coming back and concentrate. So that, that's been one of the issues. Sure. There is another, thank you. There is another question uh, from Roberto Lopez. If you can share the rubrics and forms uh, that you shared during the presentation, because he, you know, he's interested in those. So if you can share those later on. Yes, if we could get your information, I'd be happy to share some of that with you. Sure, thank also, you. Go also ahead. in the chat, I, I want to point out, uh, we do have our fellow colleague, uh, Jessica Sanchez. So if you have any questions that maybe we may have missed, you can also kind of chime in a little. Sorry, Jessica, for putting you on the spot there. Um, but yes, we will be happy to share with you all any of that. Yeah. Thank you, thank you both. There is another question, uh, Yvonne Vasquez, are the quality matter standards used with Blackboard only? Um, um, not necessarily mutually, because quality matters, it, I feel that it's very universal. It doesn't have to be, you know, Blackboard. I've seen, in fact, I think quality matters themselves, they're not Blackboard based, they're Canvas or desire to learn. So it really, it focuses on the design, not the actual technology. Sure. Thank you. Another, another one from Yvonne here, QM can be used with any online course platform. I guess you answered that. Yes. Yeah. And any other questions um, for for our colleagues Jessica and and Josie? Oh, and and, and Tony, Antonia. Tony, I'm sorry, and Tony. All right. Well, twelve twenty seven. We we just want to be um, mindful of time, and certainly we want to appreciate the time this afternoon from our colleagues at UTRGB. Thank you for sharing the, the presentation and your experience and expertise in this important topic. So we look forward to um, more events. There is one uh, upcoming, um, I guess it's exactly. next week. Uh, yeah. And certainly the, uh, the announcement has been sent. So um, stay tuned as we look forward to seeing many of you attending our next webinar. Um, I guess also from UTRGB. So again, thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you. And here's our contact information and saludos a todos in Puerto Rico. Uh, I'm also from the island, but I'm here in Texas. So I'm secretly jealous of you all right now. Me, me too. So, Yo también. Uh, so. <laughs> so saludos, Ms. Borinquen. Uh, so yes, yeah, please feel free to email us, contact us uh, via our information and we will be happy to to uh, share any resources that we have with, with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a wonderful day. You too.